The Tower of London, now home to the Crown Jewels, once home to enemies of the Crown. For more than 900 years, the Tower of London has loomed over the city, a symbol of pomp and circumstance and sheer terror. The people think that the only executions that took place in the Tower in the Middle Ages. This is not so. Its walls have echoed with the screams of England's most notorious prisoners. Their limbs were tied to opposite ends of this terrible machine and the winches were turned and it literally dislocated all the joints. The Tower of London has been an armory, a zoo, a royal residence, and a torture chamber. A few years ago, more than 30 bodies were dug up beneath the tower. They were royals and commoners, guilty and innocent, many of them victims of unspeakable cruelty. Join us as we uncover the mysterious secrets of the Bloody Tower of London. The Tower of London is one of the most popular tourist attractions in England. Each year, over two and a half million visitors come to stare in wonder at the dazzling crown jewels and marvel at the regal splendor of the Royal Yeoman Warders. They also come to walk through the eerie, cold stone halls and cells and see the spot where so many famous people literally lost their heads. You do get this shiver up the spine as you're walking around, especially on a damp, foggy, misty night around the tower. It can be really off-putting, it really can. The wind is blowing along the Thames, rattling the chains over the drawbridges, and you can't help forgetting all the grim history of the tower. October 1066. Norman forces swarm across the channel to invade England. Crushing the Saxon defenders in the decisive Battle of Hastings, the Norman horde takes control of the country and proclaims their leader, William the Conqueror, king. William came north to his newfound capital of London and realized that if, unless he took a lot of precautions, he would have the public against him because no one liked being invaded. And so he decided to build himself a castle. William selects a hill along the River Thames as the site for one of the three castles he builds in London. He is not the first conqueror to recognize the tactical advantage of this location. There actually are remains of an earlier fortress and fragmentary Roman remains are there today. It was because of the Roman defences themselves that William the Conqueror chose to build his castle here rather than somewhere else in London, because he found that he had two sides of a castle already built, and so he built the White Tower in that angle. Designed by a monk named Gundolf, this first tower measures 97 by 118 feet and is constructed from white cane limestone held together by red mortar. Writers of the time comment on this mortar tempered with the blood of beasts, but in truth, the color comes from old Roman tiles which have been crushed up in the cement. Gundolf was also responsible for the original design of another castle in the town of Rochester, southeast of London. While most of the structure was built after his death, this magnificent ruin provides a rare inside glimpse into the construction of a 12th century Norman castle. The Tower of London was not only meant to defend London, it was also meant to dominate it. William the Conqueror wanted something that was at least in part a statement of royal power to say to the people of London, I'm the king, I'm here, I'm in charge of you. As impressive as it appears from the outside, the interior of William's castle was probably far from luxurious. By our present standards, it was quite harsh, but of course they had different standards in those days. And the royal family lived on the top floor, 
with an open fire burning. There was very little privacy because they didn't believe in that sort of thing in those days. And the next floor down was the Royal Courts. The third floor down was the men at arms and the personal staff. Even before it is completed, the tower receives its first prisoner. Ranulf Flambard, the Bishop of Durham. In his capacity as tax collector, Flambard has amassed a bit too much personal wealth and finds himself housed in the tower. No part of the tower was ever built specifically as a prison, but the Tower of London, like all castles in England, has always been used as a prison at one form or another. A tower that was strong enough to keep the king's enemies out was equally strong enough to keep the king's enemies in so they couldn't get out. Dual purpose. The tower proves to be a better royal home than prison. Less than six months after his arrest, the wily Flambard uses his wealth and power to engineer an escape. In those days, depending on your means, you could have your servants, you could have special food brought in, and he had lots of wine brought in, and his friends brought in more barrels of wine, one of which contained ropes. And he invited all the guards to join him in his debauchery. He got them all pleasantly drunk. He unwound the rope, dropped it from the, uh, one of the windows, and escaped. Succeeding monarchs undertake continuous renovations of the tower, intended to make it more secure. The most notable new additions come during the reign of King Henry III, who earns the nickname Henry the Builder. Henry was responsible for a really quite substantial enlargement of the tower's defences. He built most of what we know today as the Inner Curtain Wall. Intended to protect the king from the growing aspirations of his barons, the renovations nearly double the area of the tower. Within the new walls, Henry orders builders to erect additional structures to house his garrison, armory, jewel house, wardrobe, mint, and even the king's menagerie. The earliest reference we have to wild animals being brought to the tower dates from 1235, when three leopards uh, were presented to Henry III by the Emperor Frederick II. That was followed shortly thereafter by the delivery of a polar bear from the King of Norway. And this was provided with a, a rope and a collar and allowed to go swimming in the Thames, a rather curious sort of vision. In 1276, the appropriately named Lion Tower is opened to house the growing collection of animals. Visitors arriving from the city first pass through this massive barbican when entering the fortress. No doubt the roars of wild animals did little to strengthen the resolve of subjects arriving for an audience with the king. Today, there are only a few remnants of the magnificent lion tower for anyone who knows where to look. Behind me to the left, you can see just in the cobbles, there is the line of the lion tower going across from the railings right the way to the door into the shop there. And behind us to the right, literally beneath us, is the Lion Tower itself. That's the wall of the tower. Now you can see from just how much there is down here going down beneath our feet. It was a massive building. What you have to imagine is there's much again standing above ground. So it was a huge building in its own right. Henry's son, Edward I, completes the expansion of the tower grounds by building the outer curtain wall. Although ensuing years will bring many changes to structures within the walls, the outer limits of the Tower of London are now set. The Tower of London now totals 20 towers in all. Covering an area of over 12 acres, it has become a virtual city within the city. The tower would have been a very, very busy place. It wouldn't just be the king and queen, it would be hundreds of people with them. There would have been people cooking all over the place, so plenty of smoke and heat. It would have been a, a bustling place throughout its life. By the 15th century, what was once a modest fortification has been transformed into a lavish and secure royal palace. But the idol will not last. Fierce dynastic hatreds are simmering and will soon erupt 
dividing England and plunging the tower into the center of murder and intrigue. By the mid-15th century, the 62-year rule of England's reigning monarchs, the Lancaster family, is beginning to falter as a mysterious and debilitating disease strikes King Henry VI. He lost his wits and memory for a time, and nearly all his body was so uncoordinated and out of control that he could neither walk nor hold his head up. John Wethamstead, Abbot. Sensing the weakness of their enemy, the rival House of York attacks King Henry and lays claim to the throne. The ensuing clash between these two powerful families comes to be known as the Wars of the Roses because the Lancastrian coat of arms features a red rose and the Yorks contains one that is white. The intrigue of the times catapults the Tower of London into a new and sinister role. During the Wars of the Roses, the tower became more of a state prison. The great families were warring with each other, and the tower actually became not only the, a place of imprisonment, but also the scene of regicide and fratricide. The first volley in the Wars of the Roses comes in 1461, when Yorkist King Edward IV usurps the throne and makes rival King Henry a prisoner of the tower. Mad Henry, as the enfeebled ex-king comes to be known, is held in the Wakefield Tower until 1471, when he is mysteriously found dead at the foot of his prayer altar. The official line on the death of Henry VI was that he died of pure displeasure and melancholy at being deposed, but examination of his skull in 1910 showed it had been cloven with some hard instrument, possibly a knife or an ax. It's virtually certain that Henry VI was murdered to get him out of the way. Edward begins a brutal campaign of silencing his political enemies. No one is safe, not even his own family. In 1478, Edward locks his brother George in the Devereux Tower, sentencing him to death for treason. The execution is carried out in a most unusual manner. He obviously had a bit of a reputation as a drinker, so it looks very much as if, yes, he was drowned in a vat of Malmsey wine. What a way to go. <laughs> Less colorful ends await many prominent Lancastrians on the scaffold built atop Tower Hill. Others find themselves indefinitely locked away in the tower, where conditions vary greatly depending on the wealth and status of the prisoner. In those days, if you were noble, you would still be kept in conditions according to your status. Good furniture, good food and so forth. So they wouldn't necessarily have noticed any difference from their everyday lives, except that they were very clearly prisoners. For prisoners unable to afford such luxury, a stay in the tower can be a very different experience. While incarcerated for treason in 1553, Bishop John Fisher writes, I have neither shirt nor suit, nor yet other clothes. Notwithstanding, I might easily suffer that if they would keep my body warm. But my diet also, God knoweth how slender it is at any times. One thing all captives share is boredom. With time on their hands, Prisoners use belt buckles, nails, and dining knives to carve intricate inscriptions in the tower walls. Many can still be seen today. They remain as a lasting memorial to the prisoners of a turbulent and uncertain age. I think the worst thing about being in the tower, even if you were rich and you were comfortable and you were well provided for, I think the worst thing was the uncertainty of never knowing when the constable was going to come to your door and say either that you were going to be executed on the morrow at nine o'clock or you were free to go. And you just didn't know, it depended on the whim of a king. In addition to execution, unrepentant prisoners face the specter of unspeakable tortures. Although the use of torture has always been illegal in England, it is condoned within the tower walls. Now, people were never tortured unless the authorities were convinced that they were guilty. 
They were then tortured for two reasons, to make them admit their crime, and secondly, and even more important, to make them admit the names of their fellow conspirators. So torture was not a punishment, it was a, simply a persuasive method. These persuasive methods involve horrific devices such as thumbscrews, pillow winks, cashy laws, and bilbos. But the most feared torture device is one introduced to the tower by John Holland, Duke of Exeter. Although often referred to as the Duke of Exeter's daughter, victims shudder at its more descriptive name, the rack. Their limbs were tied to opposite ends of this terrible machine, and the winches were turned, and it literally dislocated all the joints. In fact, they described one person as coming out a foot taller than he had been born, or born to be. <laughs> and it, it was a pretty awful instrument. Long before it got to that stage, whether you had committed the crime or not, you admitted that you had done. The Tower of London quickly gains a ghastly reputation. This infamy grows with the events following the death of King Edward IV in 1483 and the naming of his 13-year-old son, Edward, as successor. The boy's uncle, the Duke of Gloucester, is assigned to be his protector, but instead usurps the throne. Proclaiming himself King Richard III, the Duke has all of the boy's advisors arrested including Lord William Hastings. The bewildered Hastings is dragged from a meeting of the Privy Council and summarily beheaded on a piece of building timber found lying on the Tower Green. A peer of the realm was entitled to be tried by his peers by law, but this was an act without any recourse to law, an act of pure tyranny, and it set off what we now think of as a reign of terror. Richard realizes that his monarchy will never be secure as long as the true successor, young Prince Edward, is alive. In one of the darkest episodes of tower history, Edward and his brother are placed in a secure section of the tower where their every move is controlled. The boy's doctor reports, All the attendants who had waited upon the king were debarred access to him. He and his brother were withdrawn into the inner apartments of the tower proper, till at last they ceased to appear. Dr. Argentine. In the streets of London, rumors begin wildly circulating that they have been murdered. But by whom? Only one person could be responsible for the prince's deaths, and that was Richard III. Thomas More gives a very detailed account of the murder. He says that the princes were murdered by arrangement of Sir James Tyrrell on Richard's orders, and that two men were actually instructed to do the murder to suffocate them with pillows whilst Tyrrell waited outside the door, and that they were buried neatly deep under the stairfoot under a great pile of rubble. And that is exactly where, in 1674, a chest was found containing human bones. Just two years after brutally seizing the throne, King Richard is slaughtered in a violent battle. The crowning of his successor, Henry Tudor, marks the end of the fractious Wars of the Roses and the beginning of the bloodiest dynasty in Tower history. When we continue, King Henry VIII sends his own wife, Anne Boleyn, to the tower for a date with the executioner. And her head was sliced off literally in an instant, we are told. The head was lifted up, and at that moment, the eyes and lips were seen to move. The Tudor monarch, King Henry VIII, assumes the throne in 1509. In keeping with tradition, he spends the night before his coronation in the Tower of London which is now over 400 years old and beginning to show signs of its age. During Tudor times, the royal apartments were falling into disrepair, new modes of building, new ideas of comfort were coming in, and it became rather old-fashioned, it was regarded as that. And they were used only to fulfill the tradition that a monarch spent the night or so before the coronation in the tower. While Henry rarely stays in the tower, he does make full use of it as a prison. Without a son to inherit the throne, Henry ruthlessly seeks out anyone who might have a minor claim to the line of succession 
and sends them to the gallows of Tower Hill. Public executions took place on Tower Hill, just outside the, the boundaries of the tower, and they were a very popular form of entertainment for centuries. Let's take the kids to the execution, the Londoners would say, and they'd get up early to get a good seat on the stands which had specially been erected. Not content to merely remain spectators, the burgeoning crowds often take an active part in the proceedings. The common people would surge forward after the execution with handkerchiefs and scraps of cloth and try to dip them in the victim's blood so that they would have souvenirs which were considered efficacious against certain ailments and that's something that they would keep as a memento. Uh, people weren't very squeamish at all in those days. The manner of death depends more on the condemned social position than on the severity of their crime. The poor are hanged, while the rich face the more genteel fate of beheading. The aristocrats were entitled to being executed by cold steel. This was the nearest thing to being killed in action in battle by an enemy sword, whereas your ordinary prisoners just had the hemp and rope. We were very class conscious in those days, no doubt about it. Though reserved for aristocrats, beheading is far from a civilized death. Multiple strokes are often required to sever the condemned's head. The axe was an appallingly inaccurate weapon, but remember that it wasn't a merciful era. You were there to be punished. So why should you have a quick and clean end if you tried to overthrow the throne? You, literally, you got all that was coming to you. You really got it in the neck. The most horrific sentence that a Tower prisoner can receive is reserved for those convicted of treason. It is called the Four Horrors of the Traitor's Death. And that meant that you were drawn on a hurdle from where you'd been in prison to the place of execution, and then you were hanged until you were half dead, cut down, revived with vinegar. Your stomach was slit open with the ripping knife. You were castrated as a symbolic way of ensuring that you could never have children who could have such treacherous thoughts as you had. Your bowels and entrails were pulled out and thrown on the fire which was burning by the scaffold. Then you were beheaded, your head placed on London Bridge and your body cut into quarters and they were sent to the various cities where you had lived and probably plotted against the sovereign and they were dis displayed on the city gates as deterrents. Henry's obsession with fathering a male heir reaches a fever pitch. He turns against his wife, Catherine of Aragon, who has borne him only a daughter, deciding to divorce her in favor of a younger woman, Anne Boleyn. When the Pope refuses to grant Henry a divorce, the enraged king declares himself head of the Church of England and decrees that divorce is legal. His actions sparked the British arm of the Protestant and Catholic split known as the Reformation. The English Reformation creates an entirely new category of enemies for King Henry VIII, with droves of Catholic opponents being added to the Tower prisons. One of the most notable is Henry's friend and close advisor, Sir Thomas More. Sir Thomas More was one of the finest minds of the age, a great humanist, a man of learning. He was a very devout Catholic and a man of great principle and integrity who had an international reputation for this. More's devout loyalty to his faith prevents him from supporting the king's marriage to Anne Boleyn in 1533. This decision earns him a stay in the tower and a death sentence for treason. Sir Thomas More was executed on Tower Hill. And there's a lovely story of the executioner was helping him up. He said, um, thank you for helping me up the steps. As for my going down, I'll see to myself. <laughs> Ironically, the woman who indirectly caused his death soon follows More to the grave. In January 1536, after only three years of marriage, Anne Boleyn has produced only one surviving child, a girl, the Princess Elizabeth. Rather than waste the time and trouble of another divorce, Henry has his second wife arrested on the false charges of adultery and incest and taken to the tower. 
Being the queen has some minor advantages even when awaiting execution. Boleyn is comfortably housed in the same apartment she occupied on the night of her coronation, and King Henry grants her a last special favor. Anne Boleyn was executed in an unusual manner. She was not executed by an ax. In fact, the king sent to Saint-Omer in France for an experienced swordsman to strike off her head because it would be a quicker, cleaner death. And this is thought to have been in return for her cooperation in agreeing to the annulment of her marriage and the bastardy of her daughter. On the day of her execution, Anne climbs the scaffold specially built on Tower Green. It is raised higher than usual to allow the private audience a good view of her death. The French executioner does not use a block, so Anne kneels before him, making certain that her skirts demurely cover her feet and ankles. The executioner quietly picks up his sword, which has been discreetly hidden in a pile of straw. Even though he holds the saber in his hands, he yells out, bring me the sword. Anne instinctively turns towards his voice. And her head was sliced off literally in an instant, we are told. The head was lifted up in the usual manner, and the executioner cried, behold, the head of a traitor. And at that moment, the eyes and lips were seen to move. And the onlookers were absolutely shocked. And so when Anne Boleyn's head was severed, did she see the ground coming up to meet her? Did she look down at the faces of the people gathered around the scaffold before blackness overcame her? Who knows? I'm unable to find a volunteer to prove or disprove that, regrettably. Six years later, King Henry's fifth wife meets a similar fate. It seems that the charges of infidelity leveled against her are at least partially true, and so Queen Catherine Howard does not receive the same courtesies as Anne Boleyn. She must suffer the wrath of the English Axeman. The night before her execution, she asked for the block to be brought to her apartments so that she could practice how to lay her head on it and make a good death so she wouldn't let down the noble house of Howard of which she was a member. The final victim condemned under Henry VIII's reign, the Duke of Norfolk, never makes it to the gallows. The night before his scheduled execution, the Duke is awakened in his tower cell by the ringing of all the bells in London. The king has died in his sleep, thus bringing Norfolk an unexpected reprieve and a sudden end to Henry's 38-year bloody rule. When we continue, the great fire of London rages out of control, placing the tower in the path of destruction. It was used as the main gunpowder store for the tower, and you can imagine what would have happened with just a simple spark in the wrong place. September 2nd, 1666. Fire breaks out in the wooden tenements along Pudding Lane. The wind-whipped blaze quickly roars out of control, heading directly for the Tower of London and its secret, deadly contents. It was used as the main gunpowder store for the tower, and you can imagine what would have happened with just a simple spark in the wrong place. Bang goes the White Tower in every single sense. As the flames creep ever closer with no salvation in sight, tower officials agree to a radical plan they will use the gunpowder to blow up the buildings that surround the tower walls. The gamble pays off. The demolished buildings create a firebreak, and the tower is spared. But the rest of London is not as lucky. In a four-day rampage, the inferno destroys nearly four-fifths of all the structures within the walled city. The rebuilding effort, spearheaded by Christopher Wren, is an enormous undertaking that will transform London into one of the great modern cities of its time. The new London ushers in an era of more refined tastes. The tower is still bursting with political prisoners, but torture has fallen out of favor, with the rack employed for the last time in 1640. This more humane atmosphere in the tower has an unforeseen side effect, an increase in escapes. 
I researched and found about 40 who escaped. Thousands didn't. No security is 100% certain, so we always had a few daring ones who evolved a different methods of, uh, of escaping. Perhaps the most unique method of escape ever employed by a tower prisoner belongs to Scotsman William Maxwell, Earl of Nithsdale. In 1716, Lord Nithsdale is implicated in a plot to depose King George I and regain the crown for the Scottish House of Stuart. He was captured and brought to the tower with several other lords, Scottish lords. They were all condemned to death. And they had more or less resigned themselves, as one does in the Tower of London, to meet such an end. On hearing of her husband's arrest, Lady Nithsdale travels on horseback from Scotland through a horrible winter storm to plead for mercy from King George. When her petitions fail, she changes her tack and masterminds the escape of her husband. Of course, in those days, they were allowed to visit the condemned husbands, and she brought down with her two of her friends with extra coats over their own coats, and they worked out a strategy whereby they moved in and out, covering their faces with handkerchiefs, weeping bitterly at the coming execution of their master and husband. The women appear so agitated that the guards take no notice as they constantly move in and out of the cell. The jailer soon loses track of their comings and goings. It is precisely the effect Lady Nisdale hoped for. Now there is a window of opportunity for the Lord to escape. She worked out a plan that she would make him up to appear like a woman with heavy makeup on and a wig, and in the melee that they so cleverly and cunningly constructed, Lord Nisdale, sobbing bitterly, walked out past the yeoman warders. To complete the ruse, Lady Nithsdale remains in the cell and holds a long conversation with herself in two voices. As she leaves, she locks the door and instructs the servants not to disturb her husband while he is at prayer. By the time the deception is discovered, the Lord and Lady Nisdale have escaped to Rome, where they happily live out the rest of their lives. And apparently the king said, well, with a, a wife like that, he deserved to, to escape the axe. Rather nice, I thought. On April 9th, 1747, one of Nithsdale's fellow conspirators, Simon Fraser, Lord Lovett, earns a less enviable place in Tower history when he becomes the last man ever beheaded in all of Britain. The makeshift bleachers erected on Tower Hill are crammed with so many spectators that one collapses, killing 20 people. Watching the mayhem from atop the gallows, Lovett wryly quips, the more mischief, the better sport. It seems a fitting close to this barbaric chapter in British history. As the 18th century wore on, the tower played host to fewer and fewer prisoners. And indeed, one of the last, uh, most notable prisoners of the late 18th century was an American, Henry Lawrence. Lawrence, the president of the Continental Congress, is captured off the coast of Holland when his ship is overtaken by a British man of war. When a search of Lawrence's belongings turns up a treaty pledging Dutch support for the American Revolution against England, he is branded a rebel and led to the tower in chains. He seems to have had a rather miserable time. The governor of the time, a man called Gore, took a dislike to him. Gore seems to have contrived to make him take his daily walk at moments of the day when the public could go up at him. Lawrence records one incident where he was sort of shoved out through the front door with a sword in his back to make sure he went out there and could be seen by the public. After 15 tumultuous months of confinement in the tower, Lawrence finally wins his release in exchange for Lord Charles Cornwallis, a British general being held by American troops. Lawrence holds the distinction of being the last American prisoner of war ever held in the tower. When we return, 
World War I rages, and the tower is once more pressed into service. In the First World War, 11 German spies were actually shot at the Tower of London. In 1837, Queen Victoria ascends to the throne. This marks the beginning of a new era for England and the Tower of London. State offices, which once dominated the tower, are now all but gone. Even the venerable menagerie, which has been a part of tower history for 600 years, is finally closed in 1835. Most of the animals are moved to the new Regent's Park Zoo, and the Lion Tower is later raised to open up the western entrance. That was really rather unfortunate because what must have been one of the most magnificent and certainly most formidable parts of the tower disappeared at the stroke, almost at, a, at the whim of the Victorians who wanted to clear away the area and make it a, a more historic, in inverted commas, environment for visitors. For the first time in its history, the tower is treated as a major tourist attraction. It quickly becomes successful with the number of paying visitors climbing from 11,000 in 1837 to more than 95,000 in only four years. The Tower of London has always been a place of interest for visitors, and even in the medieval period, we have references to foreign dignitaries coming to the Tower to look at the armory and other attractions. So, the Tower of London as a tourist attraction goes back many hundreds of years. The grand old tower settles gracefully into its new life, but its days of official duty are not completely behind it. June 28, 1914. The assassination of Austrian Archduke Francis Ferdinand plunges Europe into war. Great Britain allies with France and Russia to fight the German menace. For a brief time, the famous tower reverts to its former role as a state prison, housing 11 captured German spies. They were condemned to death, and then they were brought back to the Tower of London, and in a little firing squad, which used to stand only yards from my apartment in the tower, there they faced the firing squad and were shot. During World War I, the tower staff attempts to maintain a normal routine, but it becomes increasingly difficult with the advent of a new weapon of war, the airplane. The Kaiser had actually uh, instructed his political advisers not to bomb the royal palaces and historic buildings of London. But as the war dragged on and air raids became more frequent, the tower came under greater threat. On June 13, 1917, an unexploded bomb falls into the moat area, but none of the tower buildings are harmed. That will not be the case 30 years later, when Great Britain is once more thrust into war. During World War II, the Tower of London serves numerous functions. Its basements provide protection as air raid shelters. The filled-in moat sprouts a victory garden. And some of its buildings once more house prisoners of war. Nazi leader Rudolf Hess is detained in the tower for four days, and German spy Joseph Jacobs is executed on August 15, 1940. He has the distinction of being the last person ever executed in the tower. As the war intensifies, London is pummeled by a relentless barrage of heavy aerial assaults from Nazi planes and rockets. Nothing is safe, not even the tower. From 1940, uh, it was subjected to heavy bombing raids, and many historic buildings were blown apart or damaged. We moved everybody out as the bombs were starting to drop. And luckily for everybody concerned, after everybody was cleared out the old hospital block, it took a direct hit. But there was nobody injured by it. 
Although the damage to the tower is extensive, it does have an unexpectedly positive result. Previously unknown archaeological artifacts are discovered within the ruins of Victorian buildings. But it was only really when that was being demolished that it was realized that some of the original curtain walls of Henry III's reign actually survived intact, literally encapsulated within the Victorian structure. History built upon history, both a reminder of how deep the roots go in this venerable monument and a promise of the riches the tower still holds for us to discover. To this day, ongoing archaeological digs continue to discover surprises that add greater detail to the continuing story of the Tower of London. Well, the tower is a tremendously complex place. It's been developing really ever since William the Conqueror built it in 1066 or started it off. And it's almost like a layer cake. And that's why it's such an endlessly fascinating place archaeologically, because there is all that evidence for the past laid out beneath your feet, and quite literally in many cases. It is this incredible wealth of history that annually draws more than two million visitors to the tower. They come to walk the halls and ramparts, to capture a glimpse of the ages that have passed before. I look at the Tower of London as a living history book. If you control the Tower of London, you control the country, hence its size and its majesty. When I walk the grounds of the tower today and I go into the towers and look at the chambers that still survive, I'm overwhelmed with a sense of history. I'm absolutely fascinated by this place and always have been, and I find that it's the sense of history that is so compelling. There are still eight prisoners inside the tower, a flock of ravens whose wings have been clipped so they can't escape like Lord Nithsdale. The birds are tended by a raven master whose job is to make sure they thrive. And for good reason, it's been prophesized that if the ravens ever fly away, the Tower of London will crumble, along with the monarchy itself. I'm Arthur Kent for the History Channel. Thanks for watching. For more information on the Bloody Tower of London, please visit our website at historychannel.com.